Good morning, everybody. It's Saturday, and that means um, we're doing the Undiscovered Self with my friend Luke Randa. How you doing, Luke? Hey, I'm pretty good, Martin. How are you doing? Good, good, good. We'll start a little bit uh, with a little bit of a smudge here. Got some Palo Santo, and then you had some tuning forks you wanted to ring for us? I was going to ring a, a fork here, mostly for me. Probably won't be able to hear it over the oh, mic. Yeah? But... See these wobbling. Oh, we can't hear it, huh? No, it's uh, it's too low of a sound. Oh. Schumann resonance. I have a friend. You should do an interview with her. She does um, astrological tuning forks. Oh, cool. She's got them um, uh, tuned to uh, Pythagoras' uh, um, music of the spheres. Oh, wow. Right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's really cool. She's in the caribou. Uh, does uh, tuning fort therapy. <clears throat> so <clears throat> how was your week? That was all right. Yeah. Busy. You took a big fall. I took a, I took a fall off a ladder. Yeah, I'm a little beat up, actually. Mm. This, uh, we're, we're, um, Mercury's about to turn direct uh, tomorrow, the next day there. And so I think that a lot of us have been kind of in the fog all week. Huh? It's been an uh, interesting um, time to move through, huh? Yeah, it's been a bit, uh, um, a bit, a bit of a, uh... A retrograde for sure a lot of things sort of pop up and show you what uh what you weren't paying attention to i guess right the right are. and then pluto and then um, saturn turned direct this week and then also uh, right with the mercury turning direct jupiter's turning direct too on the same day then we have the full moon coming up um, um on the 20th which will be really um I think quite important. And then I'll do some uh, posts on those two. And then on, um, on Friday, the 20th, the 22nd, I'm doing a lecture for um, the Victoria Jung Society uh, on the philosophical rose and healing the soul, which is um, a lecture on uh, Jung's essay on the psychology of the transference, which is uh, probably one of his most esoteric um, presentation of the healing process and it was meant as the introduction to Jung's um, uh, alchemical work and so I'm really looking forward to that and really active in in um, in preparing that so that's been really cool and I was thinking we could do that as a as a series uh, when we're done with this one yeah that'd be really interesting yeah if anybody's interested I'll put the link in the comments and uh, it would be great to have people uh, tune in uh, to that. Uh, again, it's a it's a um, it's a live it's an online event on Zoom uh, for the Comox uh, Valley Young Society, uh, the Philosophical Rose. So, so we're going to start with the first chapter of um, of the Undiscovered Self, and we thought we'd just read right through it because it's going to be fairly short. And then it's gonna br and it's gonna bring some discussion to go along, and then we can discuss it at the end more. Um, does that sound good to you, Luke? Yeah, it sounds good. You want to start? Yeah, I might chime in here and there in between paragraphs, but it's pretty oh, uh, self-explanatory, you know. Do you have the the little book, The Undiscovered Self, like this? Uh, no, I actually gave my little book to a friend of mine. I just have the. Uh, the volume 10 collected works. Right, volume right. 10. The translation is a little different. Oh, is it? A little bit, yeah. We're going to see oh. some differences. That'll be cool. Oh, and cool. also in this volume, there's an introduction by um, by William McGuire, McGuire who's a, a powerful figure in Jung's work. And um, he talks about how uh, the undiscovered self was first called the present and future. Oh, cool. It was the, the original title, and um, it was um, motivated by this uh, gentleman uh, called um, Carlton Smith, who was the prime mover in The Undiscovered Self. 
Uh, they had discussions, Carlton Smith and Jung, about the state of the world. Then uh, the undiscovered self is written fairly late in Jung's work. Uh, it's one of the last books that he's done. And so he's quite candid about the state of the world. And um, also it's the book is dedicated to uh, uh, Harold Fowler McCormick, who uh, was the son of Edith Rockefeller McCormick. And, um, and um, so the book is dedicated to him because he just passed away. And so these are uh, really intimate uh, figures in Jung's work. And so that's who it came about from. And again, I think it's important to realize that um, um, this was uh, one of uh, Jung's um, last uh, book that he wrote. Uh, and this essay is really pointed to, you know, what is going on at that time. And as we'll go through it, we'll find that uh, it's really appropriate to what we're going through uh, now. Um, so that was the, that's the introduction that's not part of, um, of the collected works and it's right. in the little book. Right, cool. And I believe the little book is available still. I know I have a friend um, in England who was going to get herself a copy and follow along with us. And so if you're following along the series, you know, do ask us some questions or comments. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll follow through and um, we'll, um, and even sometimes if you want to be included in the, in the video, um, it'll be fun to have you. Uh, we look at this as a study group. Uh, so you want to get started? Yeah, sure. We might as well. Okay. You want me to start here? Yep. Okay. So this is first chapter is called The Plight of the Individual in Modern Society. What will the future bring? From time immemorial, this question has occupied men's minds, though not always to the same degree. Historically, it is chiefly in times of physical, political, economic, and spiritual distress that men's eyes turn with anxious hope to the future. And with anticipations, utopias, and apocalyptic visions multiply. One thinks, for instance, of the chiliastic expectations of the Augustan age at the beginning of the Christian era, or of the spiritual changes in the West which accompanied the end of the first millennium. Today, as the end of the second millennium draws near, we are again living in an age filled with apocalyptic, apocalyptic images of universal destruction. What is the significance of that split, symbolized by the Iron Curtain, which divides humanity into two halves? What will become of our civilization and of man himself if the hydrogen bombs begin to go off or if the spiritual and moral darkness of state absolutism should spread over Europe? It's amazing how you just need to replace a few sentences and this, um, this is really uh, appropriate to today, huh? Oh my God. So if it's not jumping out at people, how what's going on today is reflected in this work, I don't. I don't know how better to explain it. Well, uh, the entire volume, uh, I was looking at uh, volume 10 before we got started and volume 10 is so appropriate, you know, the, the, the essays, uh, but this is, you know, you know, the core and the heart, this essay is the, is the heart of that volume 10. So, um, Wotan would be an interesting one to do too, I think probably one day, maybe volume 10 the whole thing well i think that we could focus on uh, different parts of it for sure because that's you know 600 pages so yeah. <laughs> we'll be at it for a while um yeah. so i'll go with the second uh, paragraph mm. it sounds good we have no reason to take this threat lightly everywhere in the west there are sub sub subversive minorities who sheltered by our humanitarianism in our sense of justice, hold the incendiary torches ready with nothing to stop the spread of their ideas except the critical reason of a single, fairly intelligent, mental stable stratus of the population. One should not overestimate, uh, overestimate the thickness of the stratum. It varies from country to country in accordance with, rash, with national temperament. 
Also, it is regionally dependent on public education and is subject to the influence of acutely disturbing factors of a political and economic nature. Taking plebiscites as a criterion, one could, on an optimistic estimate, put its limit at about 40% of the electorate. A rather more pessimistic view would not be unjustified either, since the gift of reason and critical reflection is not one of man's outstanding peculiarities. And and even where it exists, it proves to be wavering and inconsistent. The more so, as a rule, the bigger the political groups are. The, masses, the mass crushes out the insight and reflection that are still possible with the individual. And this necessarily leads to doctrinaire and authoritarian tyranny if ever the constitutional state should succumb to a fit of weakness. Wow. What did you get from that? Uh, that's one of the quotes I took out of the book and just wrote down myself because I thought it stood out. But uh, Gustav Le Bon, who Young cites quite a bit through this essay and through some of his other works dealing with crowd consciousness, he always brings up like you could have the most intellectual people in the world if you put them together in the group they go down to the lowest common denominator right and it's just amazing where ra rationality any type of reason they it's it's only emotionally based right like they just reason is out the door now once you're in a crowd it's so weird it's well weird i think phenomenon. it's it, it, I think it's in, interesting that he says that, you know, this, this stratum of educated people, about 40% of, of the population, you know, and a more justified pessimistic view would, be un, would not be unjustified. I think he talks about, you know, and, and I think that, you know, a lot of reading Jung's work, we kind of have to kind of translate into, you know, 21st century kind of language. But it, it, there seems to me a stratum of the population, you know, that is the, the more, you know, if we, you know, use the word enlightened in our day and age, you know, there's the, you know, there, you know, and depending on where you are, you know, I know on the island here, you know, we probably have a 30 or 40%, you know, stratum of the population that is more progressive and more educated. And then, you know, the majority, you know, the, the, the mass consciousness, that, that stratum of the population, you know, you know, whether it's 20%, 30%, or 40%, keeps in check, you know, the collective psychosis. Um, but, you know, then Jung says the mass crushes out the insight and reflections that are still possible with the individual. And then if the state doesn't go crazy to a fit of weakness, then we have author authoritarian tyranny and really feels like he's explaining what we're going through as a collective. Uh, but also, you know, this book was written, you know, during the rise of the Iron Curtain and after World War II. So Jung was witness to a, quite a, a collective psychosis himself. Yeah, well, he talks about the end of the millennium too, right? Being a big marker and absolutely coming well, the, into the, the next age, chapter right? deals. Go ahead. The next paragraph deals with that. I'll let you read it. Okay, here we go. Rational argument can be con conducted with some prospect of success only so long as the emotionality of a given situation does not exceed a certain critical degree. If the affective temperature rises above this level, the possibility of reasons having any effect ceases and its place is taken by slogans and chimerical wish fantasies. That is to say, a sort of collective possession results, which rapidly develops into a psychic epidemic. Under these conditions, all those elements whose existence is merely, merely tolerated as asocial under the rule of reason come to the top. 
Such individuals are by no means rare curiosities to be met with only in prisons and lunatic asylums. For every manifest case of insanity, there are, in my estimation, at least 10 latent cases who seldom get to the point of breaking out openly, but whose views and behavior, for all their appearance of normality, are influenced unconsciously by pathological and perverse factors. There are, of course, no medical statistics on the frequency of latent psychosis for understandable reasons. But if, but even if their number should amount to less than 10 times that of the manifest psychosis of the manifest criminality, the relatively small percentage of the population figures they represent figures they represent is more than compensated for by the peculiar dangerousness of these people. Their mental state is that of a collectively excited group ruled by affective judgments and wish fantasies. In a milieu of this kind, they are the adapted ones, and consequently, they feel quite at home in it. They know from their own experience the language of these conditions, and they know how to handle them. Their chimerical ideas sustained by fanatical resentment appeal to the collective irrationality and find fruitful soil there. They express all those motives and resentments which lurk in more normal people under the cloak of reason and insight. They are therefore, despite their small number in comparison with the population as a whole, dangerous as a source of infection precisely because the so-called normal person possesses only a limited degree of self-knowledge. Wow. And again, it's right out of Gustave Le Bon with the psychic contagion. Like he literally uses those words contagion. Like it's, it's, it's amazing, man. And possession. Young goes into that in volume eight as well, or volume nine, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the psychic, a bit more. the psychic epidemic. And so, so uh, yeah, it's like wow. Um, so let's uh, go on. Uh, next next paragraph. Most people, you know, because now he's going to talk about kind of how that you know deepens or anyway he continues to explain it. Most people confuse self knowledge with knowledge of their conscious ego personalities. Anyone who has an ego consciousness at all takes it for granted that he knows himself. But the ego knows only its own contents, not the unconscious and its contents. People measure their self-knowledge by what the average person in their social environment knows of himself but not by the real psychic facts, which are for the most part hidden from them. In this respect, the psyche behaves like the body of whose physiological and anatomical, anatomical structure, the average person knows very little too. Although he lives in it and with it, most of it is totally unknown to the layman and special scientific scientific knowledge is needed to acquaint consciousness with what is known of the body not to speak of that not to speak of all that is not known which also exists and that's really you know so so self-knowledge doesn't only, you know, is not only about ego personality, but it's also about understanding the unconscious. And that's really Jung's most powerful, one of Jung's most powerful contribution is an understanding of the unconscious, you know, the shadow and the collective unconscious, all powers that have a lot more to do with how we behave than our ego consciousness would like to think itself in control but uh, the unconscious um does uh, uh, you know could re you know is really a much more powerful datum that jung uh, gave so much um focus to it's amazing mm -hmm. 
I, I like the uh, the paragraph previous where uh, slogans and chimerical wish fantasies will replace reason. Yeah, you, can, you can't get any more self-explanatory than just looking up the world today. It's well, he, he, after slogan. he builds his case. You know, first he says, you know, well, here's the situation, psychic epidemic. And one of the things that would stop psychic epidemic is self-knowledge. But so few people have self-knowledge because they don't understand their own conscious. So then he continues to build his case. You want to get the next paragraph? Yeah, and we'll just keep going through here because he just keeps hitting it. Yeah. Keeps hitting the nail right on the head, this guy, eh? He's, yeah. What is commonly called self-knowledge is therefore a very limited knowledge. Most of it depend, depended on social factors of what goes on in the human psyche. Hence, one is always coming up against the prejudice that such and such a thing does not happen with us or in our family or among our friends and acquaintances. On the other hand, one meets with equally illusory assumptions about the alleged presence of qualities which merely serve to cover up the true facts of the case. In this broad belt of unconsciousness, which is immune to conscious criticism and control, we stand defenseless open to all kinds of influences and psychic infections. As with all dangers, we can guard against the risk of psychic infection only when we know what is attacking us and how, where, and when the attack will come. Since self-knowledge is a matter of getting to know the individual facts, theories are of very little help. For the more a theory lays claim to universal validity, the less capable it is of doing justice to the individual facts. Any theory based on experience is necessarily statistical. It formulates an ideal average which abolishes all exceptions at either end of the scale and replaces them by an abstract mean. This mean is quite valid, though it need not necessarily occur in reality. Despite this, it figures in the theory as an unassailable, unassailable fundamental fact. The, the exceptions are either extreme, though equally factual, do not appear in the final result at all, since they cancel each other out. If, for instance, I determine the weight of each stone in the bed of pebbles and get an average weight of five ounces, this tells me very little about the real nature of the pebbles. Anyone who thought on the basis of these findings that he could pick up a pebble of five ounces at first try would be in a serious disappointment. Indeed, it may well happen that however long he searches, he would not find a single pebble weighing exactly five ounces. Beautiful. It's such a simple example, huh? Yeah, but it does, you know, but uh, so statistical truth. Um, yeah, I'll let you read the next paragraph. It talks about it. Yeah, I can I could elaborate more, but he he hits on it further later. And then I'll bring up what I want. I want to bring up here because it's basically what they do right now. They just bring exactly. everyone down to the same level when we're actually individuals. Well, the statistical method is you know is is it fails the individual but go ahead the statistical method shows the facts in the light of the ideal average but does not give us a picture of their empirical reality while reflecting an indisputable aspect of reality it can falsify the actual truth in a most misleading way this is particularly true of theories which are based on statistics the distinctive thing about real facts however is their individuality. Not to, not to put too fine a point on it, 
One could say that the real picture consists of nothing but exceptions to the rule, and that, in consequence, absolute reality has predominantly the character of irregularity. This consideration must be borne in mind whenever there is a talk of a theory serving as a guide to self-knowledge. There is and can be no self-knowledge based on theoretical assumptions. For the object of this knowledge is an individual, a relative exception and an irregular phenomenon. Hence, it is not the universal and the regular that characterize the individual, but rather the unique. He is not to be understood as a recurring unit, but as something unique and singular, which in the last analysis can be neither known nor compared with anything else. At the same time, as a member of a species can and must be described as a statistical unit, otherwise nothing general could be said about him. For this purpose, he has to be regarded as a comparative unit. This results in a universally valid anthropology or psychology, as the case may be, with an abstract picture of man as an average unit from which all individual features have been removed. But it is precisely this, these features which are the, of paramount importance for understanding man. If I want to understand an individual human being I must lay aside all scientific knowledge of the average man and discard all theories in order to adopt a completely new and unprejudiced attitude. It can only, I can only approach the task of understanding with the free and open mind, whereas knowledge of man or insight into human character presupposes all sorts of knowledge about mankind in general. I think we should just continue. Go for it. Because he just keeps hitting on it and then we can comment later, right? Well, that's what I was thinking. I was reading it, you know, to prepare and I was thinking, you know what? There's nothing really I can say here, man. This guy's really thorough and is, and that's really the beauty of Jung. Go ahead. Now, whether it is a question of understanding a fellow human being or of self-knowledge, I must in both cases leave all theoretical assumptions behind me. Since scientific knowledge not only enjoys universal esteem, but in the eyes of modern man counts as the only intellectual and spiritual authority. Understanding the individual obliges me to commit the lese majeste, so to speak, of turning a blind eye to scientific knowledge. This is a sacrifice not lightly made, for the scientific attitude cannot rid itself so easily of its sense of responsibility. And if the psychologist happens to be a doctor who wants not only to classify his patient scientifically, but also to understand him as a human being, he is threatened with a conflict of duties between the two diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive attitudes of knowledge, on the one hand, and understanding on the other. This conflict cannot be solved by an either or, but only by a kind of two-way thinking, doing one thing while not losing sight of the other. That's uh, such a, you know, that's Jungian psychology. You know, Jung's psychology is about the individual first and foremost. And I was just reading, you know, you know, Jung was talking about um, Adler and about Freud and how they have psychology without the soul. And and to for Jung, psyche meant soul, and so in the individual. Uh, you know, psyche, you know, anyway, uh, I'll keep reading. In view of the fact that, in principle, the positive advantages of knowledge work specifically to the disadvantage of understanding. The judgment resulting therefrom is likely to do something of a paradox. Judged scientifically, the individual is nothing but a unit which repeats itself ad infinitum. 
and could just as well be designated with the letter of the alphabet. For understanding, on the other hand, it is just a unique individual human being who, when stripped of all those conformities and regularities so dear to the heart of the scientist, is the supreme and only real object of investigation. The doctor, above, above all, should be aware of this contradiction. On the one hand, he is equipped with the statistical truth of his scientific training, and on the other, he is faced with the task of treating a sick person who, especially in the case of psychic suffering, requires individual understanding. The more schematic the treatment is, the more resistance it, quite rightly, calls up in, in the patient, and the more the cure is jeopardized. The psychotherapist sees himself compelled, willy-nilly, to regard the individuality of a patient as an essential fact in the picture and to arrange his methods of treatment accordingly. Today, over the whole field of medicine, it is recognized that the task of the doctor consists in treating the sick person, not an abstract illness. That was in his day, not in our day. Let's just remember that. Today, it's all about abstract illness and putting people, that's why the, the pharmacopoeia, right? They give you medicine to bring you down here. And if you're down here, they bring, give you medicine to bring you up so that they can put everyone in the middle, right? They want everyone to be brought down to the same level. That's why doctors spend so much time trying to diagnose you so that they can look on their computer and see, well, this, for this diagnosis, it tells me to do this rather than treating the individual, right? And, uh, and, to, and to looking at the psyche as what's not well, you know? And so, and yeah, and but uh, that would, you know, that's um, that takes us further off, off field. Go ahead. This illustration from the realm of medicine is only a special instance of the problem of education and training in general. Scientific education is based in the main on statistical truths and abstract knowledge and therefore imparts an unrealistic, rational picture of the world in which the individual as a merely marginal phenomenon plays no role. The individual, however, as an irrational datum is the true and authentic carrier of reality, the concrete man, as opposed to the unreal ideal or normal man to whom the scientific statements refer. What is more, most of the natural sciences try to represent the result of their investigations as though these had come into existence without man's intervention in such a way that the collaboration of the psyche, an indispensable factor, remains invisible. An exception to this is modern physics, which re recognizes the observed is not independent of the observer. So in this respect as well, science conveys a picture of the world from which a real human psyche appears to be excluded, the very antithesis of the humanities. Under the influence of scientific assumptions, not only the psyche, but the individual man, and indeed all individual events whatsoever, suffer a leveling down and a process of blurring that distorts the picture of reality into a conceptual average. We ought not to underestimate the psychological psychological effects of the statistical world picture. It trusts aside the individual in favor of anonymous units that pile up into mass formations. Instead of the concrete individual, you have the names of organizations and at the highest point, the abstract idea of the state as the principle of political reality. The moral responsibility of the individual is then inevitably replaced by the policy of the state, raison d'état. Instead of moral and mental differentiation of the individual, you have public welfare and the raising of the living standard. 
the goal and meaning of individual life, which is the only real life, no, no longer lie in individual development, but in the policy of the state, which is trust upon the individual from outside and consists in the execution of an abstract idea, which ultimately tends to attract all life to itself. The individual is increasingly deprived of the moral decision as to how he should live his own life, and instead is ruled, fed, clothed, and educated as a social unit, accommodated in the appropriate housing unit, and the muse in accordance with the standards that give pleasure and satisfaction to the masses. The rulers in their turn are just as much social units as the ruled and are distinguished by the fact that they are specialized mouthpieces of state doctrine. They do not need to be personalities capable of judgment but thoroughgoing specialists who are unusable outside their lines of business. State policy decides what shall be thought and studied. Do we need to touch that in this day and age? It's amazing. This is yeah, his, yeah. Uh, his comment kind of on communism and socialism, right? And he keeps kind of going on, but it's with, People always say with uh, like the communism and socialism, it's the equality that they seek for is actually equal in misery, not equal in equally thriving, right? It's like equal mm -hmm. in misery, right? They level you down, as he says, to a statistical average, which is usually the lowest common denominator. But I'll, I, I'll think, I think what's really important to understand too is that this is compiled at the end of his career, you know? where he spent 60 years of his life studying. And so to be able to point, to put it so succinctly and so clearly, you know, again, he just lived through a mass psychosis of World War II, you know, and, and, his, and in his um, Civilization in Transition, volume 10, he explains these ideas, but here it's done in a, in a very succinct matter, which is really quite mind blowing how clear he can be, huh? Well, and this is the only, only the first chapter. By the time we get to the end of this essay, it's just like, it's amazing, man. Well, let's, uh, we have only two pages left. So let's uh, finish and then we can chat more. Cool. The seemingly omnipotent state doctrine is for its part manipulated in the name of state policy by those occupying the highest position in the government where all the power is concentrated. Whoever by election or caprice gets into one of these positions is subject to no higher authority. He is the state policy itself and within the limits of the situation can proceed at his own discretion. With Louis the Fourteenth, he can say, "Les états moi." No, no, l'état, c'est moi. <laughs> he is thus the only individual, or at any rate, one of the few individuals who could make use of their individuality if only they knew how to differentiate themselves from the state doctrine. They are more likely, however, to be the slaves of their own fictions. Such one-sidedness is always compensated psychologically by unconscious subversive tendencies. Slavery and rebellion are inseparable correlates. Hence, rivalry for power and exaggerated distrust pervade the entire organism from top to bottom. Furthermore, in order to compensate for its chaotic formlessness, a mass always produces a leader who infallibly becomes the victim of his own inflated ego consciousness as numerous examples of history show. Wow. Communism in a nutshell right there. Well, not just communism. I mean, we can talk about what we're going on right now in our world and, and how uh, appropriate that is. Oh, and, and in a sense, you know, I, I'm, uh, when you were reading that, I was thinking of Liz Green's statement that, um, 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 you know, 
to you know to be sick in this you know to be to be healthy in a sick society feels like you're not well yeah. do you want do you want a krishnamurti quote question that touches that yeah Krishna, krishnamurti said it's no measure of good health uh to be well adjusted to a sick society yeah well, it's it's said a little bit differently in liz green her book on saturn as well so i attribute it to liz green but uh, yes it says the same thing uh, to be well adjusted to a sick society is not a sign of health yeah <laughs> so is this my turn or your turn uh, it's your turn here i think it's where we on 501 yeah yeah this development becomes logically unavoidable the moment the individual combines with the mass and thus renders himself obsolete. Apart from the agglomeration of huge masses in which the individual disappears anyway, one of the chief factors responsible for psychological mass mindedness is scientific rationalism which robs the individual of his foundations and his dignity. As a social unit, he has lost his individuality and becomes a mere abstract number in the Bureau of Statistics. He can only play the role of an interchangeable unit of infinitesimal importance. Looked at rationally and from outside, that is exactly what he is. And from this point of view, it seems positively absurd to go on talking about the value of meaning of the individual. Indeed, one can hardly imagine how one ever came to endow individual human life with so much dignity when the truth to the contrary is as plain as the palm of your hand. Okay, here we go. We only got a few more left, so let's just go through it. Mm -hmm. Seen from this standpoint, the individual really is of diminishing importance, and anyone who wished to dispute this would soon find himself at a loss for arguments. The fact that the individual feels himself or the members of his family or the esteemed friends of his circle to be important merely underlies the slightly comic subjectivity of his feeling. For what are the few compared to with tens, 10,000 or 100,000, let alone a million? This recalls the argument of a thoughtful friend with whom I once got caught up in a huge crowd of people. Suddenly he exclaimed, here you have the most convincing reason for not believing in immortality. All that lot wants to be immortal. The bigger the crowd, the more ne negligible the individual becomes. But if the individual, overwhelmed by the sense of his own puniness and imp impotence, should feel that his life has lost its meaning, which, after all, is not identical with public welfare and higher standards of living, then he is already on the road to state slavery and without knowing or wanting it has become a proselyte. I'm going to repeat that one. The bigger the crowd, the more negli negligible the individual becomes. But if the individual, overwhelmed by the sense of his own puniness and impotence, should feel that his life has lost its meaning, which, after all, is not identical with public welfare and, stand and higher standards of living, then... He is already on the road to state slavery and without knowing or wanting it has become its proselyte. The man who looks outside and quails before the big battalions has nothing with which to combat the evidence of his senses and his reason. But that is just what is happening today. We are all fascinated and overawed by statistical truth and large numbers are daily apprised of the nullity and futility of the individual personality. 
since it is not represented and personified by any mass organization. Conversely, those personages, person, person, those personages who strut about on the world stage and whose voices are heard far and wide seem to the uncritical public to be borne along on some mass movement or on the tide of public opinion, and for this reason are either applauded or execrated. Since mass suggestion plays the predominant role here, it remains a moot point whether their message is their own, for which they are personally responsible, or whether they merely function as a megaphone for collective opinion. Okay, I'll finish this off here. Yeah, that was a powerful paragraph though, huh? It's amazing, it's amazing. Under these circumstances, it is small wonder that individual judgment grows increasingly uncertain of itself and that responsibility is collectivized as much as possible i.e. is shuffled off by the individual and delegated to a corporate body. In this way, the individual becomes more and more a function of society, which in turn usurps the function of the real life carrier, whereas in actual fact, society is nothing more than an abstract idea like the state. Both are hypostatized, hypostatized, that is, have become autonomous. The state in particular is turned into a quasi-animate personality from whom everything is expected. In reality, it's only a camouflage for those individuals who know how to manipulate it. Thus, the constitutional state drifts into the situation of a primitive form of society, the communism of a primitive tribe where everybody is subject to the autocratic rule of a chief or an oligarchy. Wow. What a what a powerful what seven pages <laughs> seven pages and seven pages Jung and that's only uh, part one of the essay mm, and um, we still have um, um, how many parts seven seven yeah so we're just gone through one seventh of the essay how do you feel how 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 was this for you? It was good. Normally, I don't like uh, reading other people's work. I I find like the free flow with my own thoughts is easier. But for some reason, when I'm reading this, I don't stutter as much. I think it's because I resonate with it so so much, you know. Right. But yeah, the I, leveling yeah. off of the statistics, the slogans. It's funny. It's like I could just keep thinking of like the news, like cases. Look how many cases, cases. Yet if you ask any individual you meet, you don't know anyone who's been afflicted with this so-called uh, so-called beer bug that is going around. Right. It's just funny. Like, and uh, the I thought about you know the how the state has taken on like this autonomous nature of its own. Like we have now these. Uh, anonymous reporting lines that people call into to like uh turn their neighbors in for not following the uh rules or whatever and it's like just this anonymous thing and he doesn't you know it's like it's kind of like the big brother big brother is watching well i mean and and i think it's important not not to um you know like like at one point he says you know whether the 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 state actually plans it or it's actually been you know it just unfolds out of a natural state the psychosis you know i i don't think that um you know like he says you know the 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 rationality and the moral choice becomes inflamed by mass decision where mass with the mass becomes right and the, and the, and and then the psychopath becomes well adjusted to that and therefore you got a situation and that's what happens in a collective psychosis in a collective psychosis everybody is in a psychosis not just the ones that are in psychosis but those also who stand outside you know so that you can get just as psychotic in all of the theories that can come out of that 
And, and so the real solution to a mass psychosis, Jung points out, and he'll point out later as, as we go along, is it's the individual. The power remains in the individual. And so individual commitment to our own individuality and to each other as, com you know, as communities, it, it's become really the only way that we can overcome a state of collective psychosis is by not allowing the psychosis to take us over as well. That's really difficult. Well, then, then, go ahead. Well, you know, he uses the words contagion and suggestion a lot, right? And it's like, like I, even hypnotherapists will talk about it or like, you know, you're the guy that brings you up on stage to hypno, hypnotize the crowd. You know, like the people who are strong individuals, they can't be hypnotized. Right. They're just, they're too, too strong of an individual. So that suggestion, if you are a strong individual, won't affect you as much you know and that's kind of that's what my whole channel is about like what i've been talking about like shoring yourself up as an individual you won't be swayed so much by the current of the collective right and that's what it's all about ayn rand and nathaniel brandon and all these people have just said you know individual like this is where it's at you know there is no there is no state in reality you know it's all individuals that comprise together to make this thing right and we have to kind of remember that. That's what he says about the rocks, right? Like, you know, that statistical average isn't even real. It's fake. Yeah, 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 yeah. Powerful ideas. I, I'm, I'm reflecting, as you were saying, you know, what, what the astrological component brings to that, you know? And, and I think that as a, as a healer, you know, those of us who, who feel that it is our responsibility to show up, to heal the, the the individual you know when you when you're in individual analysis with an individual and you're trying to support them into not just being in control of the ego personality but to dive deep into their soul what the astrology of it does what the astrology does and what Jung's techniques of of analytical psychology and dream analysis is they help us uncover what that real person is so Jung calls you know the the persona the persona being the factor that makes me this mass man you know so Jung look looks at at the persona being the mask that I wear to interact with ma with the masses and how I am part of the mass and and so the persona means mask and now the mask breaks down when one attempts the process of individuation or to discover the self to 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 realize who i am fully then that's what these tools are there for and in the next uh, chapter jung will talk about uh, these uh, um, tools that we have to uh, resource ourselves so that we don't become caught up in uh, this uh, psychic ep epidemic. So yeah, do you want to talk about astrology for a minute? Because I was just thinking, like the age of Pisces, like I feel like now, like, it's like almost like what people are expressing with this collective psychosis is like, the refusal to let go of the age of Pisces. Because when I think about, like, the age of Pisces, it was very collectivized with the, the religions and stuff like that, but it's, it's ruled by Neptune, right? And like Neptune has this sort of, like it's sort of a dissolving and it's sort of like this mass, like you're dissolving into this mass, right? And whereas, you know, Aquarius does focus on community and the collective and stuff like that, but it also has that individual side to it as well, right? And that discipline. Whereas like the Neptune, it almost seems like it's like a, yeah, I'm just trying to think of a good way to put it. You're the expert here. So does that well, resonate with you? Well, yes, but um, I think that um, more importantly, uh, you know, and you can't lose the sight, the fact of the sight that Pisces is also ruled by Jupiter. Yeah. And and so then we have the divine sun, you know, the the Jupiterian archetype of the of the of the sacred masculine as being really you know the big masculine god and 
And when, it, you know, and, and Liz Green talks about this is um, what happens in, um, you know, in the age of Pisces, the shadow is Virgo, the opposite was Virgo. And so then we have the Virgin Mother and the, you know, and, and, and the goddess of nature being really relinquished to the shadow, you know, so the heart, you know, mother, you know, nature. So, so then the Jupiterian inflation of our, you know, pat patriarchal society that empowers everything masculine. So the divine son becomes a, a contagion, you know, where, where we empower masculinity and degrade nature and declare our power over nature. And yes, we know the age of Pisces and the, the Christian era really well. Um, although, you know, Jung really helps us understand the true message of Christianity still in our, in our collective, we really, you know, I failed to really remember what that was about, you know, in terms of the development of the individual and Christ and bearing the cross and the process of self-realization and individuation being, you know, the, the Christian ethos, um, you know, has been overruled by scientific materialism. And so in that sense, scientific materialism uh, was created out of this Jupiterian Piscean kind of, of mindset, which empowered the rational mind and and now we have um, we're put into this position of having to again realize what is spirit, you know, because we we kind of completely ostracize spirit out of our culture, and now spirit is haunting us in the form of a collective psychosis. So so to bring back to the point that you were talking about in terms of. Of, uh, of the age of Aquarius. So the age of Aquarius, you have uh, the Aquarian ideal of, of, um, of community and it's a utopic sign, you know, it's also driven by technology and by advancement of the human instinct. Um, in terms of what we talked about mass, you know, the, 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 the you know, mass consciousness of the Aquarian age and then the opposite, the, the shadow of it, the challenge is in Leo. And so then Leo is the individual, Aquarius is its community. And so in that sense, we really are giving birth to a new age in that we're becoming increasingly Aquarian and denigrating the individual. And as a Consequence to that, we have individuals that take advantage and who become oligarchical, you know, become dictators and who know how to take power of these, this mass trance, this mass psychosis. And so then individual, now we can see these individuals. And so it leaves us, a, a, you know, that, that, that are misusing the power and that are putting the rest of the individuals into a state slavery. And so, you know, it really puts us in a, you know, in, into understanding, you know, because we idealize what that means, the age of Aquarius. And we hear, you know, the song, you know, the age of Aquarius, Jefferson Airplane and, 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 um, and we see this ideal of, of peaceful communities and utopic communities, uh, but, and then the shadow of it in the individual and realizing how to empower the individual and to be part of communities that are sensible. That's, you know, and in that sense, I, I think that we've been in there for, you know, we've been in that struggle for, you know, Jung sometimes looks at um, at the first stars of Aquarius coming uh, into the ascendant point or into the rising or the, 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 the rising point, the first few stars of Aquarius uh, coming into the pre predecession of equinox and coming, um, you know, in, in the early 1940s, you know, and so the beginning of the 
you know the the individual versus the you you know the utopian and the individual ma you know you know massaging the mass psychosis to ter terrible circumstances and then we had other you know repeating and so then in the age of aquarius i think you know a redefinition of the individual and the redefinition of who we accept as leaders is a really big process that we're going through and that's going to be very painful but also um the um you know, and, and, and in his esoteric work and in Eon, Jung talks about the rise of the Anthropos and that in part of this great change that we're going through is that all of us are seeking a divine experience within ourselves. We are seeking the sacred marriage within ourselves. And so in Christianity, God became man. Now, in the age of Aquarius, God is becoming um, in the individual, or we're learning to realize God within ourselves. Not that we are God, but that God is within each of us, and that's what the analytical psychology is, and that's what the this you know the the undiscovered self is is this part of the, the of the of the human that is his soul, his spirit, and how to reconnect with that and how to rebalance the masculine and the feminine nature. Uh, but, um, you know, those are just kind of brief thoughts about, you know, what I see anyway, and what Jung's teachings seem to point towards. Yeah, well, I think Jung and Aeon even said, like, Christianity needed a major upgrading. You know, it hadn't been nothing had been revised for 2000 years almost, you know, he felt like it needed to have some type of a modernized upgrading in a way to make it fit the times. But to go back to what I was saying about Pisces, Liz Green also says, like what I'm saying, when people won't let go of this age of Pisces, she talks about like the redeemer or the savior slash victim, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's like, people are just throwing themselves out there to be you know the savior slash victim you know right now i see like almost the negative side the real negative side of pisces coming out but you, you know you're right what you say about aquarius and the shadow and leo that perfectly fits our time so much well and yes yes and 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 i think we have a lot and we can be discussing this uh, whole uh process of of giving birth to the to the age of Aquarius and that's what um, volume 10 is about you know and so volume 10 of the collecting work collected works civilization in transition and this essay we're discussing is just a central part of that volume really important and then um, and then but to, to echo what you were saying about Eon you know the the, the next volume after that um, um, psychology and religion uh, uh, Jung really establishes or makes it clear. And then actually the next uh, chapter in the book that we're reading right now will really talk about that. And so we're kind of giving uh, an introduction to the next, uh, yeah. next week's uh, chapter. But um, in um, Psychology and Religion, uh, Jung talks uh, about um, a ritualistic, the, 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 the great contributions, again, the psychology and religion is East and West. And so he compares in the books, in that book, uh, the Christian religion and then the Western religions. And, uh, you know, it's a really beautifully, um, uh, that's a volume 11 of the collected works. It follows um, volume 10. So um, both of those are really worth readings. And then, um, and uh, we'll continue to explore that. Um, I don't know if that was really satisfying what I talked about the astrology of our times and we can get into more pointed, you know, what's going on currently, but I do that in my videos on astrology. And so I think that maybe we'll spare our, um, our audience uh, that and they can look up um, in, uh, in my work on uh, the current astrology of our times. 
yeah and, then, and i uh, think we can do it in a conclusion too like when we're done our video series we can have a conclusion where we talk more about that stuff as well right i think that'll fit in nicely at the end once we get through this essay you know yes and and uh, the whole uh, experiment that we're doing together is really co-creative and we have no idea where it's going to lead and and it's really important for us to hear from our audience and so please if you have time um mm, uh, comment and ask questions and uh, share this and um, and let us know what you think about this and um, my um, my um, YouTube channel is the Healer and the Dreamer Astrology and yours is what uh, feel the link feel the link and so we're starting to to have some cr uh, cross pollination how is your channel going yeah, it's pretty good. I wanted to put out a video this week, but I hurt myself at work, so I couldn't get it out. It's going to be Michael Mead and uh, elders versus olders and a few other things in there. But uh, I got some nice comments from some followers of your channel. Uh, Carol commented and said, uh, we're doing a great job. So thanks, Carol. Watch thanks, it. Carol. Yes, uh, Carol's <laughs> been actively commenting on mine. And then I'm going to Mercury is turning direct on Monday and, um, you know, ladders and Mercury retrograde sounds like that fits pretty well and felt like this week I was uh, full of obstacles and it wasn't flowing really well, but uh, um, seems like uh, the energy is shifting powerful full moon next week and so I'll be posting on that too. Um, and um, we keep it going and we'll uh, talk with each other on um on next Saturday. Sounds good, buddy. I think it went over pretty well today. Yeah, I think so. Let's uh, let's hear let's let's keep going. It was pretty video, exciting. Video is longer than we thought it would be, but that's all right. People can handle it, I think. Uh, yes. Well, we'll see. Um, individuals here. who uh, have an attention span, anyways, will you know enjoy it. Well, it's an experiment, and then again, uh, let's see what kind of comments we get, and then. Uh, keep on going. I think we'll get good at it if we keep going. Yeah, I'm going to get better as time goes on. Jupiter's coming into my 10th house here soon. So and Neptune's getting the F out of there. So oh, I'm and then coming that, into my own here. And Jupiter is transiting my sun. So that's exciting. Uh, yeah. But um, let's uh, let's close out and we can chat out after. Sounds good. MC Peace. Starman in the house and Luke Randa. Thanks for joining us. Whoop, whoop, whoop.